in your final lab, you will be determining the glucose concentration in two popular drinks, which are, are Coke and Gatorade. So this is quite a, a complex experiment for you to do, and you're getting quite a few skills out of this. So we're going to be doing an enzyme assay, which will allow us to determine the glucose concentration. So the results of your enzyme assays, you'll be able to plot a calibration curve or a standard curve. So you'll have some known uh, samples with known glucose concentrations, you'll be able to plot that calibration curve, and then use that curve to determine the glucose concentration in your Coke and Gatorade samples. Um, so you'll also be writing up a lab report for this, and in that describing your results and noting any unexpected results as well. So we'll go through that in week 11. So the enzyme assay that we'll be going through is a two-step assay. So in the first step, the glucose reacts with ATP and the enzyme called hexokinase catalyzes this reaction. So it phosphorylates at carbon number six of glucose. So you can see a phosphate group there being attached to carbon number six. And ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, loses one phosphate group, so it produces ADP. So that's the first step of their action. So the product of that is glucose 6-phosphate. The second step of the reaction is then that glucose 6-phosphate reacts with NADP+. The enzyme that catalyzes this step is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And so the products of that, we get 6-phosphogluconate and NADPA. So this is a redox reaction here. We're having the glucose being oxidized and the NADP plus is reduced to NADPA. So that's a redox reaction there. So as a result of those two steps, then NADPH is produced. So the more glucose that you have at the start, the more NADPH is produced as a result of those two reactions. So the way that we're going to determine the glucose concentration is through measuring the NADPH that is produced. So that's directly related to the concentration of the glucose in the drinks. So the way we can measure the NADPH that's produced is by using a spectrophotometer, which looks something like this. So it's a machine you'll have on your bench. And in that you'll have a cuvette. So you'll be placing liquid samples in this cuvette, placing the cuvette inside the spectrophotometer, pressing the buttons and then recording down the absorbance readings. So the way a spectrophotometer works, there's a light source inside the spectrophotometer. We can then choose any wavelength of light that we want to look at. So that wavelength of light, that light is then going through our sample. So we've got our cuvette with some liquid in it. That liquid sample is going to absorb some of the light. And so we can look at then the amount of light that comes out. So the higher the concentration of NADPH, the more light it will absorb, and so the higher the reading that we will get out here. So we can choose any wavelength. The wavelength that we're going to be using in this experiment is 340 nanometers. So these are so NAD plus and NADH, very similar molecules to NADP plus and NADPH. So you can see at 340 nanometers at this wavelength, then NAD plus or NADP plus has very little absorbance at that wavelength, so it's very low on the y-axis, whereas there's quite a significant absorbance there for NADH and NADPH. So if we use 340 nanometers as the wavelength in which we're going to, to monitor, this, monitor this, then the, any production of NADPH will show up, whereas NA, any NADP plus is not going to contribute to the absorbance at that wavelength. So that's why we're choosing 340 nanometers as the wavelength. So what you'll then be able to do is to plot this standard curve. So we've got concentration on the x-axis. So you'll have six samples where you know the glucose concentration. You'll be able to do the assays with those. NADPH will be produced in you know, five out of the six Sample, so you'll have one with no glucose, and then five samples that do have glucose in it. So in those ones, you would expect NADPH to be produced, and so therefore there should be absorbance of light in those samples. 
and you'll be able to plot these. So you can see these data points in here are very close to a straight line, but yours may not be quite so linear as that. But what we're plotting is a line of best fit through your data points here. So for your glucose standards, where you know the concentration of glucose. What you can then do is to use that line to work out the concentration of glucose in the Coke and Gatorade sample. So you don't know their glucose concentration, but you can measure their absorbance, and then when you know the absorbance of your Coke sample, for example, you can work out from that line, work down, and find the glucose concentration in it. So in this experiment, you're given a 20 millimolar glucose standard, and so from that, you're asked to make up uh, glucose standards at, at different concentrations. So at from 0 and then 1 up to 10 millimolar. So you're going to be doing some dilutions of this 20 millimolar standard to get your different glucose standards. So from your 20 millimolar standard, you need 1 milliliter or 1,000 microliters at these concentrations here. So 1, 2, 3, 6, and 10 millimolar. So when you have prepared those, you're going to um, place them into Eppendorf tubes and label those tubes. So 1G is your 1 millimolar glucose standard, 2G is your 2 millimolar standard, and so on. 3G, 6G, and 10G are 3 millimolar, 6 millimolar, and 10 millimolar. So you'll need to do some calculations before you come into the lab, and you can use C1, B1 equals C2, V2 to help you with that calculation. So C1 is your initial concentration, which is 20 millimolar. That's the glucose standard you're provided with. V1 is what you're trying to figure out. C2 is your final concentration, so from your, your 1 millimolar all the way up to your 10 millimolar. And then V2 is 1,000 microliters, which is the, the 1 milliliter that you're making up. So if I do one of these for you, we do the, the 2G sample. So you've got 20 uh, millimolar, I'm trying to work out V1 is going to be 2 millimolar and you want a thousand microliters of it. So 2 is one tenth out of 20, so you're going to need one tenth of the volume, which will be a hundred microliters. So you might have to get a calculator and a bit of paper to do that. But you'll need a hundred microliters of your 20 millimolar standard, and then you're going to make it up to a thousand microliters. So you'll need to add water up to a thousand. So in this case here, a thousand minus the 100 microliters means you will need 900 microliters of water. So you'll need to complete that table before you come to the lab. So this is then making up your standard. So your 1 millimolar is going to be labelled 1G, so you should have 1,000 microliters of glucose at a concentration of 1 millimolar, 1,000 microliters at a concentration of 2 millimolar, 3 millimolar, 6 millimolar, and 10 millimolar. So you'll be able to prepare those when you come into the lab. You're then going to zero the spectrophotometer. So just so we've got a baseline reading, it's a bit like when you tear the balance before you weigh something. So it's setting a, a zero level. So we'll be placing some distilled water into the cuvette. You'll be zeroing it. So we'll show you which button to use to zero it. And then you don't need to re-zero it again throughout the entire lab. All the, the subsequent times when you want to take a measurement, you'll hit a different button to take a reading. So we don't want to re-zero again and in between each of these experiments. So for your enzyme assays, you're going to be mixing several reagents together. So once you mix them all together, then the reactions are going to start. And if glucose is present there, either in, from your standards or from the Coke or the Gatorade, so if glucose is there, the reactions will all start, NADPH will be produced, and the amount of NADPH is pr that's produced is directly related to the amount of glucose that is present in the sample. So you're going to be doing eight assays, so six standards where you know the concentration of glucose, plus Coke, plus the Gatorade. So the Coke and the Gatorade are the only ones where you don't know the concentration of glucose. So we're going to be incubating these, so your, your samples plus all the enzymes and the buffers. We need to make sure that the incubation times are the same.
for all eight assays. So for this experiment, the incubation time is going to be 15 minutes. So from the time where you add the final reagent and take a, you've already done the first absorbance reading, but yeah, you're going to add in the final reagent that's going to then incubate for 15 minutes in a water bath at 37 degrees, and then you're going to take a second reading. But we're not going to try and do all eight samples at once. We're going to stagger these at two minute intervals. So you'll need to be really organized so that you can stick to this two minute um, schedule. So here's a, a summary of how this is going to work. So you're going to have your six standards. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, 10. And then you're going to have your two samples there. So Coke and Gatorade. So what you can do is in a cuvette, so you can place 700 microliters of water. You can then place that cuvette into the spectrophotometer, take an A1 reading, so you'll be able to write that one down in, in your table here, and then you'll be able to transfer that distilled water into a microcentrifuge tube or an Effendorf tube which will be labelled as zero. So that's, these are your labels here for your microcentrifuge tubes. So at that point, nothing's happened. All you've got in your centrifuge tube now is water. You get then a clean cuvette. You're going to add in 35 microliters out of your 1G standard that you prepared. You're going to add in 665 microliters of water. You can mix those by pipetting, so it's a mix well by pipetting, so you can just, using that larger pipette, you can suck up and squirt out that liquid a few times, that will mix it. You can then, you want to make sure there's no bubbles in that solution, um, and then you can take an absorbance reading for that, and you'll write that one down in the table here. So that will be your A1 reading for the one millimolar solution. You'll continue to do that. So once you've taken that A1 reading, transfer that to a microcentrifuge tube labelled 1. For the next one, so 35 microliters out of your 2G standard that you prepared, plus 665 microliters of water. Mix it well by pipetting. Place that cuvette into the spectrophotometer. Take an A1 reading. Write it down on the table here and then pour it into a centrifuge tube labelled 2. So continue to do that for each of your samples there. So 35 microliters plus 665 microliters of water, mix it, take an A1 reading, write that value down, and then place it into a micro centrifuge tube with each of these labels here. So at that point, no reaction has started yet. So we haven't added all of the reagents to be able to do that. So once we add in this final reagent here, which is the, the TEA buffer, which contains everything else required for the reaction to start, that's when the reaction will start, and we want to make sure that we are consistent with the amount of time that each of these reactions have. So this is where you need to be quite organised here. So what you're going to do is so add in this final reagent in two-minute intervals, and then you're going to place the tubes in the water bath and they will then incubate it at 37 degrees. So to the first tube, you'll add in 350 microliters of this buffer. So you can then press start on your timer. Make sure it's starting at zero and working up. Don't start at 15 minutes and count down, but start from zero and count up. So like a stopwatch. So you're adding in your 350 microliters cap. Just invert the tube a few times and then place into the water bath there, which is at 37 degrees. So that's the optimal temperature for these enzymes to work at. So that'll take you maybe half a minute or a minute to do that. So when the time gets to two minutes on your stopwatch, you're then going to add 350 microliters of buffer to the second microcentrifuge tube, which is labelled 1. So cap and mix the solution, so inverting it, and then place it in to the water bath at 37 degrees. So every two minutes here, you're going through the same process. So you're adding 350 microliters of your buffer, cap, 
mix and place into the water bar. So that'll keep you busy until the time equals 14 minutes. So at 14 minutes, you should be doing the final sample, which is the Gatorade flow. After 15 minutes, what you're then going to do is take them out of the water bath one at a time and take an A2 reading. So when your stopwatch gets to 15 minutes, you're going to take the tube that's labelled zero out of the water bath, transfer it into a new cuvette, and then you will write that value absorbance reading down as your A2 sample. So from zero to 14 minutes, we're writing down our A1 readings. When we get to 15 minutes, we'll then start writing down the A2 readings. So for each of these, there should be 15 minutes from when we added the buffer and put it in the, in the water bath to when we're taking the second reading. So this will occur at 15, 17, 19, 21 minutes, and so on. So at 17 minutes, you're taking the tube labelled one out, transferring it to a new cuvette, taking an absorbance reading, and then writing that one down. So this will keep you busy from 15 up to 29 minutes there. So then you'll have finished this table. By the time you get to 29 minutes, you'll have A1 readings and A2 readings for each of your eight samples there. We're not necessarily looking for any trends in those columns there. So don't be worried if these aren't increasing your A1 values in that table. We're not looking for any trends at that point. What we want to do, though, is to take the A2 reading minus the A1 reading. So the A2 reading here minus the A1 will give us their absorbance difference. So hopefully we will see a trend with our standards here. So from the 0 millimolar to the 10 millimolar, hopefully we will see an increasing glucose concentration is then resulting in an increase in the absorbance for those samples. We're not going to expect to see an increase in the A1 values because the reaction hasn't started, we haven't produced NA, NADPH. We don't know what to expect for the Coke and the Gatorade samples. So once you've done all that, you'll be finished the experiment for the day. I'll take you through in the workshop in week 11 how to then analyse your data and to prepare a graph like this. So what you'll have will be concentration of your standard, so your 0, 1, 3, oh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, and 10 millimolar standards. You'll have absorbance readings for those. And from that, you can plot this line of best fit. So you can see here, I've done this one on Excel. We can get a value for this slope. So this is a straight line, y equals 0.16x. And this is going through the origin here. And that R squared value is, is very high there. That's just showing that these data points are very closely fitting that line. So from that, you'll be able to then work out the concentration of your Coke and Gatorade. So those data points will fit on that line. So depending upon what absorbance readings you get for those, you'll be then able to put those on the line, read down, and get the concentrations for those. And then it's a couple of steps from there to convert them from millimolar to then get them into grams per 100 mil. So you'll have to factor in there, so they're the molecular weights, and any dilution factors, so a couple of steps in those calculations there. So I'll take you through that in the, the workshop at the end of week 11.